Okay, I think uh, we can get started. Um, welcome everyone to today's session uh, from Maori to Deaf Engineers, welcoming all contributors. I'm Catherine Paganini, um, Head of Marketing at Buoyant, the creator of Linkerd. I'm also one of the co-chairs of the TAG Contributor Strategy and the facilitator of the Deaf and Hard of Hearing Working Group. Um, yeah, so let's start by introducing our panelists today. Um, so why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and tell the audience what you, how you're involved in the TAG. Um, Destiny, do you want to start? Oh, the mic you have to switch it on. Okay. Hello, I'm Destiny O'Connor. I uh, am co-chair of, uh, and web developer and co-chair of the CNCF Deaf and Hard of Hearing Working Group. I uh, support and help educate people to learn more about accessibility and help with the Deaf and Hard of Hearing um, requests and accommodations. Uh, kia ora te whanau, uh, he uri ahau no Ngāti Apa me Ngāti Tūwhare Toa o Ku Iwi. Uh, no JT um, kia ora, my name is Jay. Um, that was just a quick intro on Māori. Just, um, I belong to the Ngāti Apa and Ngāti Tūwhare Toa tribes in New Zealand. Um, I've been told our accent, just quickly for the interpreters as well, can be a little bit hard to follow. If I'm like blending vowels or too much slang, call me out. That's, um, I'm happy to switch things up. But I am um, part of the TAG Contributor Strategy Group as well. I'm the co-chair of the Mentoring work, Working Group alongside Nate, and I try and support um, a couple of other initiatives like the uh, Deaf and Hard of Hearing Working Group and Higher Ed Working Groups, and I'm a community manager with IINZ. Shout out to the team. Um, kia ora. Hi, I'm Jay Jackson, and um, I'm a senior software engineer for Total CX. And I've been part of the Deaf and Hard of Hearing Working Group for some time. And I want to be supportive of getting more deaf into the field, and it's becoming my passion to do that. Okay, great. Um, so let's start uh, with that question for you, um, um, UJ. You know, it's complicated, we have to. <laughs> so what motivated you to create pathways for Maori youth into open source? Um, first of all, I, I didn't know anything about open source till about two years ago until I connected with the team. So it was a uh, big learning curve in itself, but I was really fascinated about um, the nature of open source and how it was about transparency and collaboration. And it didn't matter what your background was or where you came from, it was about you know, consistency and being prepared to show up and contribute what you have to add to some sort of collective value. And those sorts of things um, really resonated with me. So when it came to working with young people, and I, I work with um, a lot of schools and tertiary education providers and different community organizations, um, I saw a lot of value for young people there because, um, well, a few reasons. But our education system, um, like many, is not really effective at building our young people up for the future. Um, a lot of standardized and industrialized approaches in terms of building an education that's going to be relevant for what the future is going to look like. Um, and the same sort of deal with trying to support them into the changing workforce. There's a lot of misunderstanding about how to um, ensure that curriculum is relevant to where the industry is going. Um, I also thought like the idea of volunteering was really important because um, quite often it's you know, the focus is starting on that $25, $30 an hour job as opposed to being prepared to, you know, develop your work ethic and learn you know, those fundamental skills first. And so the idea of, um, you know, your merits being acknowledged um, as opposed to how well you sell yourself in a resume or an interview doing the work first, um, I thought that was really important, um, you know, sort of lesson for them to sort of understand in terms of how else they can sort of communicate their value and just for young Māori in general, um, they, for the most part, don't understand their value. You know, it's, um, there's a lot of things in terms of drawing from um, our whakapapa and our mātauranga, you know, our lineage and our, um, our knowledge and things that are, that are there and inherent, but there's a lot of things that we still don't understand about, you know, what is 
what is the skills and the value that they really have to bring to the world. So I thought there was a lot of potential in open source in general about, you know, how they could sort of broaden their horizons and, and understanding of themselves and, and what else they could do to sort of change the world around them. Okay, great. And what has been the response so far and can you share some progress that you've made? Yeah, so um, it's been interesting because most people I've found don't really know um, about um, open source in general, even less so about Kubernetes. You know, people are, are curious and, um, you know, you start telling them about, you know, data orchestration management and self-replication, all these sorts of things. Like, it's, it's interesting, but it doesn't quite stick in terms of, great, well, how does that sort of, you know, relevant to us? Um, but and the same sort of thing is that, that interest and that curiosity because people sort of understand that there's some sort of potential there. So we've been able to run or um, support different events and workshops. Um, you know, we've recently kicked off um, with help of Abby from our team as well, um, a program, some of the schools to start introducing them to different open source platforms and um, just trying to, again, trying to introduce them to something a little bit different. But I think um, one of the response from the wider Māori tech community um, has been really important to understand how we can better support that and open source um, in terms of its potential with things like data sovereignty and again different sorts of access points has been really key because um, I mean the, the, the participation number in, in Māori uh, for Māori in tech in New Zealand is really low anyway. I think it was f around 4% last year. It's jumped up around 05 since and so there's a lot of conversation in terms of, you know, what are the systemic issues as well as the behavioural ones that we need to address to, you know, help shift that dynamic. Um, there's a lot of structural things that aren't really set up for Māori to be able to participate meaningfully. So just being able to contribute to trying to explore some of those sorts of solutions, trying to understand, you know, what are those sorts of things in the wider sort of tech sector for Māori, um, I think of well, some of the work being able to do that is being able to gradually feed back to how we can support, you know, and build up the presence in open source in general. Okay, great. And the next question is for um, you and Destiny. Um, so, I mean, obviously we all know that it's really important to um, include marginalized groups, but why do you think personally that it is important? Um, Destiny, do you wanna get started? Sure, yeah. So. This is important to me because some uh, deaf out there can speak. Sorry, let me go back. Most, I grew up with mostly a hearing family and they don't sign. And so I lip read and speak most of the time interacting with them. So uh, I have kind of a, a, an interesting perspective interacting with the hearing community in that way. But because of that, so like one-on-one -on -one conversations are great with the advantage of that is? Because some people assume that you speak well, um, you don't need accommodations. And so often uh, that is taken advantage of, and I still need accessibility uh, because I'm deaf and I don't always uh, use my voice in those type of situations. Jay? Um, yeah, of course I can only speak from, from personal perspective. Um, but, I mean, the, the, the benefits of diversity and, and opening up to other cultures and perspectives, it's, it's pretty well documented, you know. Um, that's why we encourage fresh eyes. It's, um, you know, being able to encourage others, be able to share their unique view of something and look at a problem or an issue from a, you know, different sort of angle and, you know, start to begin, you know, foster innovation in that sort of way. That's, that's all pretty clear. But um, I think from, from Māori Dim, um, one of the concepts is, um, around what we call manaki tanga. And it's around how we sort of, you know, when we're talking about welcoming people, we can, we can welcome people in the sense of we can be polite and friendly and accommodating, we can allow them to drop into meetings, we can allow them to, you know, give their ideas and post discussions, but it's not necessarily the same as making people feel welcome. Um, you know, how do we open our, our spaces, our homes, our ideas, create safe environments for people to really feel like they belong and that their opinions and are actually valued and heard as opposed to just having a voice among the noise. And um, I think it's some of those sorts of um, concepts and values and ideals um, that I think can, again, offer a lot of value to this community. 
um, and begin to build some of that that um, greater understanding in terms of how we can um, yeah better work together and I mean it's 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 not something that's unique to Māori either it's you know a lot of indigenous um, cultures have similar sorts of ideas and things too but um, I think it's those sorts of things that can again just bring a, a a really important dynamic that not isn't not, isn't necessarily absent at the moment, but I think um, can definitely be built upon more with what already exists. Yeah, right. And um, so yeah, this is the first KubeCon that is actually accessible to deaf and hard of hearing. Um, so Destiny, can you tell us a little bit what the deaf and hard of hearing group had to do with it, what the role was? Yeah, absolutely. So we helped provide resources for the conference, what to do in those situations, what deaf people are asking for in regards to accommodations, whether that's capturing and interpreters, we provided resources for that. Uh, in the past three months, we've been working on that, yeah. It's been awesome that they've provided interpreters as well. I mean, it's, it's overwhelmingly, to be honest with you, it's, it's great. Yeah, and we also have to add that we only provided the uh, um, recommendations to the CNCF and Linux Foundation events team four weeks ago. So, I mean, it's really amazing that you're all here and can able to interact with everyone. So, huge shout out uh, yeah. to them for sure. Um, and so, Jay, so how did you find this group and um, yeah, how has it been so far for you? Well, I was part of the deaf um, professional Slack group. And it's a group of deaf professionals from all over. And um, the co-chair, um, Rob, who's in the room, he's, he's one of the co-chairs, and um, he had um, essentially set up this CNCF working group and recruited deaf folks to come in. So I decided to come in, take a look. And my experience was you know, I've had a good accommodation experience with my current job, but I know that a lot of deaf and hard of hearing people do not have the same privilege there. So I was trying to help out and see if I could do some advocacy and uh, jump in just to support the other deaf and hard of hearing members. And when I did, um, well, this is my first conference and it's my first talk too. So <laughs> um, I was really excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, it's, it's just an exciting time and I feel like the more that I'm involved and I learn what I can do to advocate and help, um, and deafness is a huge spectrum, obviously. So some people speak and read lips, some people speak some and hear a little, some people do not hear at all and are fluent in signing. Some people use closed caption, open caption, um, interpreters, there's a huge array of experiences and accommodations that meet the needs of the deaf community. So some people um, have um, very unique experiences and so I, I've just, it's been interesting to hear all of the stories and feel validated here and be able to contribute and share and advocate. Thank you. Yeah, and I think what is really interesting, like for, or for me that I learned, right, because um, is, what you just said, like that huge variety of people and the different needs on wh what they rely on differs so much. And I think there is so much need to educate the community so they understand. Um, because literally some people think like there is caption, that's enough. And no, it's not, right? Because you can watch a video on YouTube with captions, but how do you interact with people? And all these things you don't really kind of know unless you actually know get to meet deaf people because you don't think about it, right? And, and I think it was really encouraging to um, see how everyone, once you start, start that conversation with the Linux Foundation and the CNCF, it's like how um, willing they were to make those accommodations because, because they just didn't know, right? And now where they understand, they're, they're thinking, yeah, of course we have to do it. We cannot, um, we cannot just exclude a whole group of people just because we're not providing these things that are available to us. And technology is making it easier and easier, but we also need an interpreter and so on. So I think it's, it's really great that we've, again, like four weeks and we're here, you're here. It's um, really amazing. Um, so the next question is for you two as well. Like, 
J and J Jackson and Destiny. Um, so, of course, this is a maintainer track, uh, and we haven't really worked on recommendations for projects yet. And you're also new to open source, uh, so it's a little bit of a challenging question, um, but for the maintainers out there, that's next on our uh, to-do list. Uh, we do want to provide recommendations for projects. But what should project owners know about deaf and hard of hearing, and why is it important to ensure that their projects are accessible to the deaf and hard of hearing? I don't know who wants to start, like, either way. Me? Me, okay, I thought you meant the other J. Okay, um, yeah, two Js. He's South J, I'm North J. Anyway. Um, <laughs> We have a GitHub where we can contribute and, and put strategies in there for conferences and meetings, et cetera, and people are very welcome to read any of that information and provide feedback as well. Um, it's something that can be helpful and a resource out there for, you know, obviously some people are learning ASL, but that's not accessible to everyone, um, and captioning videos and all of that sort of thing. So there is a GitHub out there for this. Yeah, what Jay said also, um, really the best way to find out how to accommodate is communicate with us. Uh, contribute to a project, maybe just ask what's our preferred way of communication or what's the best way to accommodate us for our learning needs and our you know, opportunities to, commu uh, to contribute. So, you know, sometimes interpreters are the option, maybe they're not the best option, maybe it's captioning, maybe it's specific chats and notes there or whatever, you know, there's so many ways to communicate with, with folks and I think just don't feel uncomfortable to just ask and go ahead, we're definitely willing to help and more than you know, really. Yeah, I, and I think like asking or like really interacting with people and learning from them is the best way, right? Because it's like there's just so much you just don't know. And, and um, so, yeah, just lose that fear if you have any, you know, and just ask and go. And like what we're also saying, like we have a lot of uh, people here now, so come ask questions, meet them, um, right? So they'd be happy to. Um, so in general, is there anything specific uh, for projects that you would like to be inclusive that you can think of. And again, I, I know it's kind of difficult because you haven't really contributed to that, but. Right. I think just don't be afraid. <laughs> just if we are saying, hey, we're deaf and we have these disabilities and we'll let you know you don't have to run away, <laughs> ask someone else about us, just ask us, uh, provide uh, us with whatever best option that can be provided for the project, I would say. Is there anything for the, in in oh, did you wanna say something? So, I was thinking any anything from the indigenous population, that was something that projects could do to be more welcoming so that they feel Um, I know, it's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a big question because I think, um, I think it starts with why do you believe being inclusive is important? You know, as, I mean, it, it gets talked about a lot in terms, you know, diversity and equity, inclusion and everything. It's almost to the point of becoming like a marketing ta tactic or, mm -hmm. or a strategic sort of effort. It's, um, you know, it looks, it looks great to, you know, slap on your company values and, and talk about that in your culture and everything. Um, but it's, and I, and I think if you're thinking about how you can be more inclusive because, you know, you want to build the, you know, you're, you're concerned about contributor retention and attrition rates and you want to build, you know, the, the, the quality of your project because you've got these KPIs you're trying to push for and you're worried about sort of, you know, really outcome results you know, oriented sort of things, it's, I, I think you need to take a step back and, you know, I think we all have to remember, it's not about us, it's not about me, it's not about you, it's, it's who are you trying to serve and why, and how can you do that and, and meaningfully in a way that's not transactional. Um, it, it happens a lot back home, 
it's, you know, people, you know, organizations, for instance, say they want to hire more Māori because it would make them appear as more, you know, culturally, um, yeah, inclusive and, and welcoming sort of organization. You hire that one Māori person and suddenly, you know, that's what, you know, you really respect the culture. You, you had them, you name your project after that. You, um, you know, you, you have them involved in some superficial way that doesn't really reflect what it is that, you know, what your actual sort of commitment is. And quite often it's, um, you know, you've got a project, for instance, and you approach Māori at the implementation stage as opposed to the ideation. So most of the decision making is, has been done. And I think it's really important that if, you, if you're serious about inclusion, how can you bring people in and build the relationship first and try and understand what the need is and try and make them a part of what you're trying to do as opposed to bringing it in after all the serious, you know, all, all the big decisions have been made, all the heavy lifting's been done. Um, and then it's sort of like a tack on at the end. Um, I think sometimes diversity is seen as a detriment. Um, people who are seeking equity are seen as entitlement. People who are seeking inclusivity are seen as a bit of an inconvenience for what, where the real work takes place. So, but I think if people take the time to um, yeah, really think about as a project or an organization, as an individual, why that's important and leave with that first, um, I think it can really change the, the project from the inside out and all those sorts of things. People, like I said, it will be about creating that space of belonging first where people really can feel comfortable to bring the best of themselves. And all those other sorts of things that are always going to be there, that's always going to be a priority, um, will come out naturally as, as an extension of that. So I think if we can do that right, um, yeah, the, the, the change that needs to happen will come. That's very well said. <laughs> so. Um, so, unless you have anything to add? Um... Yeah, just to add to what Jay was saying, uh, the, you know, with the keynote speakers and everybody that was saying, it's all community-based and it's really just getting to know each other, interacting with one another and um, coming together on the same level. It's really important, very much a similar message, I would say. And I would add, um, they say the chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And that's the same with the community here. If we can pull other people up via accessibility, inclusivity, I think we can make a stronger community for all of us. Inclusivity is not just for people like us. It's for everyone. So if we have everyone involved, participating, contributing, it benefits every single one of us. What a great way to um, close <laughs> the talk. Um, so before we uh, open it up for questions, um, you all know this is the TAC Contributor Strategy. Um, we have a Slack channel. We have several groups, mentoring, deaf and hard of hearing, maintainer circle, lots of different things. So please check it out. Um, join the Slack channel. Um, come to one of our meetings. You can all find them on the CNCF calendar. And um, yeah, the learn more um, QR code goes to our website. We have, there you can find all our resources and we have a brand new section for accessibility where you can find the uh, recommendations for conference organizers, which we hope will be used by many more conferences, not just uh, people here um, in the Linux Foundation. And so that's an, another call to action. If you are at any conference, feel free to send them to them, you know because there are really good recommendations that come from deaf and hard of hearing to the community. So that's a very um, um, valuable resource. Um, so yeah, I think um, that's it. And uh, we're open for questions, if there are any. One more thing. Oh, I want to thank you so, so much for everything that you've done so far in contributing and making this working group happen, uh, making us feel included. And for this, it's really, uh, it was great um, for our meeting and exceeding our Thank expectations <laughs> for this year. I just want to second that quickly, because I think um, you put so much work into this, and it's something that, um, although you had, you know, you've had a really strong personal connection to it, you've never, I was saying before, you've never made it about you. You've always, you know, been working from, 
you know, behind the scenes and, and, you know, trying to build up others to be able to step in and lead the space and, you know, just being, a, you know, led really strongly with that servant lead leadership. And I think that's really important and a, like, a really strong example of what I think we're talking about. So, ngā mihi nui kia koe, and thank you very much. Thank you. This is not fair, you're making me cry. <laughs> okay, now we're open for questions. Yes, uh, oh, there is a mic over there. Uh, I'm not sure if you're remote workers or in-person workers, but I'm curious about accessibility as it relates to workflow, and maybe you can speak to your personal experiences on what has worked well from you, for you for workflows and being efficient, either be remote conferences or in-person conferences, like what can employers do to be more inclusive in those environments? Is that now specifically for deaf and hard of hearing, or? Yeah. Yeah. I do work remotely, yes. And right now, with today's two technology, I mean, we have Slack, we have Teams, we have Zoom. Um, it, it's made it very accessible for us with all the new technology. And companies um, like VRS, which is Video Relay Service, they provide um, interpreting for phone calls, et cetera, and then there's captioning. There's any number of things that we can use to make our lives accessible. And you guys use Zoom, right, Destiny and Rob? Yeah. Yeah, we do. If we're on a call, maybe we're using uh, VRS for Sorensen sometimes. They have interpreters ready uh, for that, and but there's also interpreters um, available in other capacities that, you know, that we're here to provide interpreting services and, and accommodations for us, yes. Yes, so when you ask about interpreters for meetings, my company provides interpreters over video. And we have an interpreter on the Zoom screen with us. So, so far it's been pretty good. Um, a lot of the time, um, it's a bit of a struggle because sometimes Zoom has a caption feature, which is really strange, because um, the person who's hosting has to turn it on and enable it, and many people do not know about it. So we have to educate um, the Zoom organizers to please turn the captioning on. So that's one of the things that we encounter. And we did actually have a meeting with the Zoom accessibility team and so provided feedback and they said that they would be working on it. So hopefully, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, so fingers crossed. <laughs> More questions? Um, So um, when you're interacting with software, whether it's a development environment or a uh, utility or even just a community sort of interface, um, what's one thing that you wish you had that's sort of missing that you sort of notice that is sort of never there? And that's actually for all three of you, like when you're interacting with just normal software. I would say, uh, I'm not sure if it's um, with like social media, uh, having things like if they have a podcast or some sort of developer group where they're having a conversation, I wish that it had captions or an option to have captions on there. Um, they have it sometimes, but it's not always great, not always exact as what they're saying. Um, any voicing, anything online with audio, um, there's often not a lot of access for that, so I feel like that's a missed opportunity. I would say relatively the same as Destiny did. For me, it's just interacting, um, video-based software, yeah, there's captions there, and that's pretty important to me. But, you know, sometimes the caption, I mean, it's improved. I'm not gonna say it's terrible anymore, but it's there, and it's, sometimes it's, um, it's not the greatest. So the caption feature, you know, sometimes it works great, but it, you have to kind of still try to figure out what's being said a lot of the time. Um, during a live talk, if they can get an interpreter for that, that's great. But some people um, rely solely on the captioning, which is called CART in a live environment, um, but it, it varies. 
And one thing that I thought it was funny just talking about uh, captions and that I've never heard before, but now where I'm interacting with a lot of deaf and hard of hearing people, they call it craptions. Because, and so I didn't know because I don't pay attention to it, right? Because it's like, I don't, I, I just listen, right? So um, yeah, they're, they're sometimes really bad. So if you're providing bad captions, they're not able to understand what you're saying. So really important, um, sorry, go ahead. Um, well, from, from working um, with a lot of young people and Māori in general, um, how, like, vi the visual is important and what is the story that's told? I think sometimes a lot of software, um, they, they do the what really well in terms of, yeah, what is its features and functions and all those sorts of things. They do the how, the how sort of okay, um, but at the same time, like, a lot of documentation is very text heavy, um, you know, it can switch off atten people's attention spans pretty quick, um, but, but the why can be really vague as well. Like what, who, yeah, why is it important? Why should people care about what your software does or what it is? How does that you know, potentially serve their interests? Um, so I think, yeah, that is, uh, where it makes sense, um, that, that visual components and, and how people um, in, in, interact with it is um, important. But in working with some um, neurodiverse um, people as well, um, you know, someone with like dyslexia or dyspraxia, can you, can you resize the um, fonts? Can you, um, you know, can you change the color of the background because it's, you know, you can't process the, the imagery and things that are there. So um, I think it's, again, the, the more widely you sort of interact with people and understand these sorts of things that we take for granted every day um, is, is often people's biggest barriers. And I think, um, again, that's why it's so important to reach out and, and try and understand before, before building it. So, um, yeah. And we just got the sign to stop. So that was perfect. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everyone, for showing up and enjoy the show. Thank you.